The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about all the crazy shift going on in the world of HR, recruitment, and business. I'm your host, Ira Wolf, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Keith Compagna. Hey, we've got another great show lined up for you today. I am flying solo for a change uh, because my buddy Keith and co-host has uh, another speaking engagement, uh, so we wish him a lot of luck. Uh, as he's out there uh, talking about his HROI and life work integration. Uh, But we've got a great guest, so you certainly won't be disappointed in today. This should be a pretty lively show. Um, I've been trying to get uh, Dr. Diane Hamilton on our podcast for several months. Um, she and I met through a colleague of, of ours uh, who was also a guest on the, on the podcast, Ed Crow. Uh, he was on a few months ago. We were talking about the future of HR. And he introduced me to Diane, and we hit it off immediately because her topic, her expertise, her specialty is curiosity, uh, which is also one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and it seems to me that curiosity is, I guess, the DNA of nearly every skill on every list of job skills that comes out uh, when we talk about what's going to be needed in the future. What should we be teaching our students? What do workers need? Uh, what do what will humans need to stay uh, relevant, uh, especially with advances uh, with machines and robots and artificial intelligence? So. Uh, curiosity, the more I think about it, um, she's kind of turned me into this maniac, uh, <laughs> kind of diving down and looking at uh, everything I see. It's like, wow, that you need curiosity to be successful at that. So we're going to we're going to be talking a lot about that. It'll be a very, very lively show. Uh, but before we jump into the interview, uh, I got another shout out to our new sponsor, Zor.ai. Uh, We hope to have them as guests on the show in the very near future, too. I thought about them this morning. Uh, There was an article that uh, popped up on my email feed. It was about uh, a Supreme Court decision not to review uh, a a, a case that involves dominoes. It also involves a couple other people. But it's it's really highly relevant, uh, which also fits in. It's like, why would I even read this stuff? Um, and again, that fits into my curiosity, you know, level and uh, something that uh, Jeff Hoffman, uh, which I know uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hamilton knows as well, um, that we talked. Jeff uh, was one of the co-founders of Priceline. He now has a company called Color Jar. Uh, social entrepreneurship, but he turned me on to a phrase called info sponging. And it was always about reading something uh, that has no relevance to really what you what, what your uh, passions are, what your business is. And then you start to make connections. How, how is that relevant? So I don't know why this showed up on my feed, probably in an HR thing, and it was about employment law. Uh, but what the case was, it concerned companies that could be sued if blind people can't access their websites and apps. And just last week, uh, I was interviewing Jonathan uh, Duarte uh, from Go Hire. We were talking about voice activated uh, chatbots. Uh, I was talking with Debbie Levitt, who had been, uh, I actually wrote a chapter in her book called Delta CX, which CX is kind of the customer of the customer centric uh, experience. And the question that came up in this uh, Supreme Court non-decision, a decision not to, to rule on it, was does, does uh, your website violate the Civil Rights and American Disabilities Act if the visually impaired and other disabled can't view it, can't see it, can't access it? 
So what we were talking about last week, by the way, that also involved, there was a couple other cases that got settled before this one. So the fact that they're not deciding it, it means it's still up in the air. And uh, I guess this is going to become something like the new ambulance chaser. Um, apparently, there's a lot of attorneys targeting companies if you're uh, if your websites, but we're we're kind of focusing in on the career website, your company website, and the job application. If it's not, uh, if it hasn't kept up, uh, if if you can't, if you have a, a visual or some type of a physical impairment, um, how can they learn about the job opportunities? How can they and 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 how can they apply? And are you discriminating? And and, and some jobs, you know, people have accommodated. Uh, some jobs don't require that you have 100% uh, visual acuity uh, or that you don't have any physical disabilities. And yet there, there obviously is some discrimination because the, the, the laws just aren't keeping up with the pace of, of digital transformation. So uh, kind of my reason for bringing this up is not to settle it. We certainly can't do that. Uh, but I'd love for you to share your opinions on this. Uh, if you know people that have an, you know, if you have an opinion or if you know some experts, uh, please send them my way, share your thoughts. Uh, I posted on LinkedIn, and so you can join the, the thread there. Hopefully, we'll get an active conversation, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Let us know what you're thinking. Um, if, you, if you're not on LinkedIn, not sure why you wouldn't be, but if you're not on LinkedIn, uh, visit our website, and uh, you can just fill out the go to contact us, and, and you can send me your thoughts, and, and we'll get engaged that way. Uh, if there's enough interest, I hope to bring a panel of experts together on uh, right here on the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. We'll talk about it uh, and uh, possibly do it as a LinkedIn live streaming. Uh, speaking of LinkedIn Live, um, I'm live stream, streaming again, again this week. Can't say that three times fast. Uh, this week, I'm talking with Chris Denny. Uh, he's the author of How to Improve Attention to Detail. Um, he just released a book, Improve Attention to Detail. I had no idea that there was so much there. Uh, I think many people think it's just a, a gift uh, you either got it or you don't. There's people that are attentive and they pay attention and there's people that don't. And, and uh, again, very similar thread to a conversation we're going to have today with uh, about curiosity um, about how to how to improve it. But uh, so I'm, I'm going to have that interview with uh, Chris. Last week, I spoke with uh, Jonathan Duart from Go Hire. You can get that on my LinkedIn feed. Uh, I'm going to put a page up on the website, too, with those links uh, as well. And uh, we talked about the voice activated chatbot and the job application, which was just, uh, I, I guess, a precursor to that article that just came out in, in the case, uh, you know, with uh, Domino's. And then I also talked with Debbie Levitt, uh, with, uh, who had the new book, Delta CX. And we talked about the customer experience and, and again, uh, different disabilities, even things like color blindness, color blindness, um, companies uh, pick color schemes. Um, that you know, they may stand out. They may not be the the best, or or maybe they think they are. And yet, there's a group of people that can't see them. They can't read them. Um, again, things that people need to be considered. So it's my opinion. I've got a lot of backers on this, a lot of supporters. That most companies are barely scratching the surface on catching up with how technology is disrupting the way we we search and apply and and uh, do things and with our jobs and with regulations. So stay tuned. Uh, that's what we talk about every week on Geek Skeezers and Googleization and now on LinkedIn live streaming or on live streaming because uh, we're also doing it on YouTube. Uh, want to uh, thank, uh, in addition to Zor AI, Dot AI uh, Success Performance Solutions for being our sponsor uh, going into our second year. Uh, don't forget to join Googleization Nation. Uh, you get access on tips and articles and discounts to the uh, recruitment marketing and the, for the Accidental Recruiter LMS. Uh, you can sign up at successperformancesolutions.com or geekskeezersgoogleization.com. And just uh, click on the Join Googleization Nation. And one final thing before we get to Diane. Uh, recruitment marketing for the Accidental Recruiter uh, has been the online course that I've been working on for, uh, since the publication of my book. Uh, it is just about ready. Uh, it definitely will be launched within the next two weeks, so before the end of October. Um, I've actually expanded it. Uh, it's more than just a course now. It's an LMS. Uh, we've found a nice platform, and they'll be able to easily add a lot of materials and documents and videos. I've got 20 videos just on 
uh, recruitment marketing. Uh, and But we're going to be adding a lot of other additional videos. We'll probably put the podcasts up there, too, so people have easy access to it. Other documents, things I read, white papers. Uh, to get early access, just visit SuccessPerformanceSolutions.com. Click on the button right at the top of the screen, and you'll be uh, very, very easy sign up for early access. All you need to do is give us a, your first name and an email address. And with that, I'm going to get to part of the show that we were really excited about. Uh, Dr. Diane Hamilton, who, again, just met a few months ago, uh, is president and founder of Tenera, a global consulting and coaching company. Uh, she is a nationally syndicated radio host. I was on her podcast just a few weeks ago. She's a speaker and educator. Um, she was the program chair of the MBA program at the Forbes School of Business. Pretty impressive and has taught at a few other universities. Uh, she's taught a ton of business coaches. She's a PhD in business management. Uh, she's certified in emotional intelligence, which we'll be talking about. And she works with quite a few Fortune 500 executives and entrepreneurs. And I'm just looking right here at her, the number of people who um, kind of give testimonials for her book. And it begins with Steve Forbes. Many of you might be familiar with that name. Ken Fisher, big investment guy. Vern Harnish. Uh, not too many entrepreneurs or business owners that probably aren't familiar with him. Uh, he was just actually a speaker at one of my um, good friends, uh, John Dame, uh, had Evolution uh, Conference. Uh, almost 600 people attended, and he was one of the uh, presenters there. So Tony Alessandra, um, you know, great guy with DISC. Uh, Dave Ulrich, uh, who's one of my favorites and talking about the, the future of work. So impressive group of uh, people and um, apologize to anybody that I didn't mention there because there's, a, there's just a ton of good people. So Diane, welcome to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Well, thank you, Ira. I, I'm listening to what you're doing. I'm tired. I, I, <laughs> I, can't, I thought I did a lot. You really oh, you do a lot. You, on, you know? Yeah, well, you, you're kind of a step ahead because you actually got your course, your certification. So I'm just in that stage. But uh, I, you know, you you just published your book, Cracking the Curiosity Code, correct? Yes. So that yeah. just came out this year, right? A few months it ago. It did. It did. Yeah. And so that was simultaneous with uh, the launch of that and your your uh, assessment, which I'm really excited to to uh, get. I mean, I've completed it, taken it, and can't wait to get it into the hands of my clients. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, that's which is also called the Curiosity Code Index. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. But so you, you heard you heard my uh, kind of the precursor to this, my yeah. intro. Uh -huh. uh, you've turned me into this crazy animal. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was always I always had a degree of curiosity. It was mostly about things that I enjoyed, and I guess it, to to some extent it is. Uh, uh -huh. But I always had this little I, I can't say a little knack. I guess I had a knack for connecting some dots that didn't seem to um, you know to, to fit. You know, I had people always said, "How did you how did you connect those two things?" Um, even my career change. You know, we talked about that in your show. Uh, you know, I went from being a dentist to doing this, and people always yeah. were shocked. And I didn't look at it as dentistry as a skill of learning how to drill and fill and, you know, cut and suture. Um, but it was a matter of I was running a business, you know, uh, in order to be successful. I had to learn. Um, so I needed curiosity there. But more importantly is uh, it was a business. I had staff. I had 16, 17 people at one given time. Um, how to learn how to patient relations, how to manage it. Uh, most, you know, most professionals, you, you've run across them. Most professionals don't have that interest. Uh, they just want to do their work. Uh, so I also looked at it that I had a business that just happened to be in the dental services business. And so it was an easy transition for me. So I, I was sort of always able to kind of see the insight out with that. But you've made a career out of talking about curiosity. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I don't know if I picked it up from you or it was just one of those things I created about that. I think it's the DNA of our future. I love that. And I love that you said it turned you into a maniac. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, though, you know, it's such a common word that you don't realize how many times people are using it. And now I watch every television show and the word comes up so much that, you know, my husband and I will like elbow each other. Do you hear it? You, hear it? <laughs> you know, because we yeah, hear so, it. So, so what are some examples? What are, what are, what are some well, times just, that, you, that no, you hear it there? 
Well, you know, just any show, I'm curious about this, or I'm curious, how'd you do that? Or, you know, people just use that word a lot. And Perfect. so we're used to that word and we never really think about how important it is. But when I started to write the book, I started to realize how it tied into everything. I mean, every issue within organizations, uh, you know, from leadership, uh, communication issues, emotional intelligence, soft skills, all the, the topics you hear about over and over, engagement, innovation. And I kept thinking as I was writing about curiosity, well, how's it tie into this and how's it tie into that? And as I started to interview amazing people on the show from, you know, Francesca Gino from Harvard or whoever was on the show, and I'd ask them, you know, what comes first? Is it curiosity or is it? Uh, motivation is it curiosity is it innovation what do you want everybody said curiosity came first so i'm thinking why aren't more people really working on this and you know i started looking at some of the assessments out there and there's all these assessments that'll tell you how curious you are on a high to low level kind of thing but it didn't really tell you how to fix it or what was stopping you and that was what was driving me crazy so let's get let's get down to some basics there so one of the things is, uh, you, you know, I, I guess the question would come, uh, and I, and one of the reasons that this just resonated with me, I've been using assessment for several years, and the reason that I, I used it was that one of the scales on this uh, is called reflective. I always called it curiosity, because it, it the range was from, you know, comparing. It, it's a norm scale, so it compared people from from being having a low need to probe, a low need to ask questions to being highly thought, they describe it as thoughtful, reflective. Um, to me, that means that you think about things in the past tense, not in the, in the future. So not the thought, you know, and maybe that was my definition that being thoughtful and reflective was kind of re looking back at things you've done and asking questions. And that's certainly part of curiosity, but I'm viewing it uh, looking forward. Um, so I always called it the curiosity scale, and it was the need to probe, to ask a lot of, you know, versus the, a low need to probe versus a high need to probe, asking a lot of questions, doing your due diligence. Uh, and obviously people can have different degrees. Uh, mm -hmm. So this just resonated. You just took it apart. But the question was, if let's say somebody was in the 20 percent or 30 percent reflect uh, curiosity scale or reflective mm -hmm. scale on that. Right. Um, most people said, you know, was it can we teach people how to do this? And that got to the root of what you've discovered and, and, and the history is right. that we're basically, we all have this as a natural talent. We are all curious until uh, four factors that you, that you can get into kill it. Right. <laughs> <You know>? So, <laughs> yeah. I, and I love that you had a, I think this came from you. There was a quote I, and I just love this quote. Uh, if I can find it again, I, I had a couple notes here. Um, is it uh, Jean Piaget? Is that the, the uh -huh. psychologist? Um, I don't even remember that or if that's something I came up with. Uh, that said that we come into this world as tiny amateur scientists. We ask, what is it? Why? Repeatedly. And then pe our parents and teachers and strangers tell, hey, just stop asking questions. Just <laughs> shut up and do it. <laughs> um, Right. So you you have, you have a chapter. I mean, you go into this really well. So let's talk about that because, again, because not everybody is curious mm -hmm. yet. How do we teach it? You know, or it's not even teach it. How do we unlearn the bad habits? I guess. So. Well, you, you touch on a lot of really great things there. Um, as far as your reflective and what you saw, I found similar assessments. You know, openness to experience and some of that type That's of correct. thing are out there to tell you levels, but not really how to fix it, like you said. And um, and so I you, I looked at the childhood uh, background. I mean, what what we start out as, and then what we turn into, and and where this was happening. I mean, when when did this happen, and why is this happening? And I and it's really interesting because as you talk about children, uh, in in a talk I give, uh, you know, I show a picture of two little girls at the Museum of Fine Art in San Francisco, and there's this just unbelievable amount of artwork all over the walls that they're supposed to be looking at. Instead, they're looking through this uh, vent on the wall, trying to see what's on the other side of the vent on the floor. You know, they're on the ground looking through it, and it's just such a, a, a testimonial to what kids are curious. They want to know about everything. 
and you you say how it was kind of beaten out of us. You know, how many parents will go get off the floor, stop, you're going to get dirty, come over here, look at the art, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? Think about what we experience as kids. You now we're not trying to kill curiosity in our children. You're trying to just, you know, get along in society right. to some yes. extent. Yes, teach them manners, right? Manners, right. And so some of it, you don't recognize what it is that could have shut people down. I mean, there's so many great TED Talks of, from, you know, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, George Land has a great talk. I mean, and they all look at like creativity and some of the things associated and how things, um, w what happens in childhood. And what we find is around age five, you peak with all these questions and desire to explore and uh, creativity and curiosity and all this, but then it starts to decline dramatically till it becomes almost non-existent in your adulthood. And a lot of it is, um, according to Sir Ken Robinson, you know, we educate people out of it uh, because, you know, we've created the system that values uh, math and, and science more than creativity and some of these other things. And so, you know, there's some of that. There's so many different um, things that George Land found in his research with NASA, where, he, you know, that they just they just think that there's all these environmental issues that could be part of what makes people shut down. George Land had said, you know, we, we over criticize our th thought process. Sometimes we come up with these great ideas, like we put on the, the gas really hard, but then we, at the same time, we're putting on the brake over criticizing things. And then we get nothing because it's in a car, you put on both pedals at the same time, how far do you get? Right? So, I think a lot of this was really interesting to, to research to see what we had initially, you know, because there is the, you know, Max Planck Institute. So there's a curiosity gene, you know, if you look like birds, for example, if they only looked at one bush for berries, they're going to die. They have to have that sense of curiosity to look around to, to continue to thrive. And people are the same way. We have this in us. We need this. But we've managed to beat it out of us to some extent, which has led to status quo thinking in the workplace, which right now we're trying to get everybody to be innovative. And if we have this, you know, these thoughts in our heads, this environmental influence, you know, th this, this, uh, you know, everything that we've experienced growing up telling us, you know, you know, get off the floor, you're gonna get dirty, don't look behind the vent kind of thinking, uh, it's a problem. Um, and, and the thing is, is as I said, that curiosity is the spark that leads to all these other things. I liken it to baking a cake and what we're doing in the workplace. Um, if you're gonna bake a cake, you're gonna mix ingredients together, right? You're gonna put the flour and the oil and the eggs and whatever it is you mix together and you put it in a pan and you put it into the oven. And if you don't turn on the oven, you get goo, right? You don't, no one gets cake. Right. Right. And that's kind of what we're doing in the workplace with curiosity is the spark, but that's the oven nobody's turning on. We're trying to get motivation and drive and uh, engagement and innovation and hoping to have productivity as our cake, right? Our money, you know, the end goal, but nobody turns on the oven, the spark of curiosity. So everybody's just getting goo, nobody's getting cake. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. And uh, so th that's why I think it's so important to do what you're saying, you know, look at how we were as children and what what's changed. And that's what I did in my research. What's impacting it? So you came up with four factors. Um, and I, again, the acronym couldn't be more apropos, uh, <laughs> more perfect, fate, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and again, because I'm talking so much about what the future of work is, future technology, uh, future of jobs. And, you know, so when, when you look at this and if, and if curiosity is one of the drivers of so many of the skills that you will need uh, going into the future, uh, that, that uh, you know, we need curiosity. So the kind of the fate of, I guess, the human race, fate of humanity may lie within, <laughs> you know, within this. But before I get there, we'll, we'll talk about that as soon as we come back to the break. We're, we're about two or three minutes away from that. You mentioned a couple things, and I just want to cover that. You, you said that, you know, we teach science and we teach math is STEM, you know, mm -hmm. uh, science, right. you know, uh, so science, technology, engineering and math. Um, so that's where all the emphasis goes into. But at the core of that is curiosity. I mean, how can you teach science? I mean, that is the, the nature of science. 
is right. the need to be curious, to explore, to, to do things that nobody asks. You know, why does this happen? In math, it's the same way. It, it's sort of that education itself has done it backwards. We've taught people functionally how to get to an answer rather than how to solve a problem. Correct? Am, am I, yeah, am I uh -huh. correct? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that we've taught to some extent to explore, but not. we've also over-criticized and put limitations on exploration. And just finding an answer is, you know, there's always going to be an answer, but is it the best answer? I mean, if something that worked in the past, is, it, is that going to work in the future? I mean, to quote Marshall Goldsmith, we got you here, won't get you there. Uh, just because it works one time, doesn't mean it's not like science where the answer might be always the same or math. You know what I mean? When you get into creativity right. and different things that go to innovation, you need more curiosity to get to a more unusual outcome. But, and, and it's always, we started to have this conversation. I, I didn't, and, well, just even a few minutes ago, I mean, I just didn't realize how stark or how, uh, far apart this is uh, because again the the emphasis is on stem science math engineering and uh, and uh, math um, and yet it again it's it's taught as a you know very kind of a logical process um, kind of here's the rules the regulations the knowledge you need to do now you'll now you'll be good at it um, and you may know the fundamentals but um, you know without curiosity um, how can you, you know, how's it going to advance? How, how, you know, right. where, you know, you look at a Steve Jobs, uh, you know, you go back to Da Vinci, um, you, you go back to, to people who just didn't stop asking questions and, and look Edison, you know, I mean, there's books about it and we all hold that up and then we sort of, it disappears. <laughs> so, yeah. and yeah, absolutely. So when we come back, uh, we're going to be talking about the fate of the human race. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Diane Hamilton has the cure, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I think he. But, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So you've been listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show again with my guest, Dr. Diane, Hal Do Dr. Diane Hamilton. Uh, she has a new book, Cracking the Curiosity Code. Uh, she's got a new assessment uh, of how this can help people uh, uncover and improve their curiosity, the Curiosity Index. Really excited about to get that into our portfolio. Uh, as we always do, we're talking about the future of work, the future of jobs, uh, future of humanity, I guess. Uh, we will be right back. We're going to take a short break. We're going to hear from our sponsors, Zor.ai and Success Performance Solutions. So stay right where you are. If you're not curious, you should be. <laughs> And if you are curious, we know you'll be back. See you in two minutes. Behind everything you're searching for is something you're actually looking for. When you search with the real Yellow Pages, you get more than a contractor. You get a whole new curb appeal. It's not just getting directions to a dry cleaner with YP.com. It's rescuing an old favorite from the back of the closet. And it's more than finding a locksmith with YP.com on your mobile. It's getting to sleep in your own bed. Whatever it might be, there are more ways to search and more ways to find exactly what you're looking for with the real yellow pages, yp.com, and yp.com on your mobile, only from AT&T. Imagine how your company would grow if your candidate experience earned a 99% approval rating. Well, to get to 99%, you need the three best letters in recruitment technology, XOR. Zor's text bots, chat bots, and audio bots increased IKEA's candidate conversion rate 455%. Zor decreases candidate drop-off rates, improves your candidate experience, and collects analytics for future strategies. To learn more, check out Zor.ai. That's XOR.ai. Hi everyone, this is Ira Wolf, author of Recruiting in the Age of Googleization. I'm excited to announce that my online course, Recruitment Marketing for the Accidental Recruiter, is open for business. This course is the culmination of a two-year-long project and releases recruiting tips I've learned after hundreds of hours of research, speaking with thousands of conference attendees, and interviews with dozens of experts. It's all available to you in Recruitment Marketing for the Accidental Recruiter. To receive more information or get started, visit our website at www.successperformancesolutions.com and click on the tab, Recruitment Marketing for the Accidental Recruiter. 
Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. I'm your host, Ira Wolf. Uh, my co-host, Keith uh, Compagna, is off today. Uh, he's speaking at a conference or a meeting somewhere, so we're wishing him a lot of luck on that. But we've got a really lively conversation going with our guest, Dr. Diane Hamilton, who is the author of Cracking the Curiosity Code. Great book. I suggest you go up and get it. Uh, we'll have it up on the website. You can get it up on uh, Amazon. Um, and you, or you can go through her website. Uh, and you can also, uh, we're also going to be talking about the Curiosity Code Index. So, Diane, uh, when we kind of left the air we were talking about the i guess the fate of uh humanity is hanging in the balance uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that curiosity um lies behind so many of the skills uh and so before we get into what fate is and how we can uncover that let's talk about um some of the skills so um, we talked about STEM before, but behind STEM uh, lies one of the core skills of the future is critical thinking skills, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any list that I've ever that I've seen that critical thinking and problem solving is not part of that. Right. Uh, and so I, I think it's pretty obvious that curiosity is needed, to, you know, for critical thinking. Mm -hmm. But you also, and you're certified in this, uh, as I, uh, I'm not certified in the same program as you are, but we're, we're both have been certified in, in EI programs, emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. That is starting to come up uh, as, again, one of the skills that will save human jobs or will allow humans to have jobs in the future. The one thing that's going to differentiate people from uh, machines and robots and artificial intelligence. Uh, and even, a, you know, I, again, wrote another article, this, or read another article this morning about service techs. You know, what are the jobs that service techs need? And, and you know, they talked about customer service. Uh, they talked about critical thinking. They talked about even, even for a service tech, somebody coming out to fix your air conditioner, that they even need emotional intelligence. And why? Because they have to deal with people. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It, it, you know, and it's gotten to the point where chatbots are sometimes dealing, you know, it's 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 more fun and it's easier and you get a better response from a chatbot than you do dealing with another human <laughs> being in communication. I mean, it's sad, but it's true. Uh -huh. like we've all we've all been there. Uh, so something like emotional intelligence and for for anybody who out there isn't aware of what emotional intelligence is, you know, there, there's a lot of different definitions. Um but, it, you know, some people think it's just, hey, I, I'm going to go to a course and now I'm emotionally intelligent. No, it's a, you, you don't kind of acquire that way. One is it begins with self-awareness, which is where your assessment fits in. So uh, in order where you are. Uh, and then it's uh, it's also how do I manage that now that I know about that? Uh, you know, how I deal with stress and how I deal with other people, how I deal with curiosity, you know, how do I manage that? And then it comes down, how do I manage other people? You know, how, how do I tend to manage other people? So kind of the steps are, you know, first you start with self-awareness. Uh, and uh, so that's why I, I think your, your assessment's, you know, like spot on there. Mm -hmm. But when you move into that next stage, um, you know, you wouldn't have thought that curiosity had anything to do with emotional intelligence until I saw it in your book. I didn't make the association. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because, you know, there's, so many, like you said, so many different ways to define emotional intelligence, but a lot of it is based on understanding your own emotions and understanding those in others. And so if you're able to do a self-assessment, that's one thing, but to understand other people is another issue. And I think one of the biggest parts of that is developing empathy. And if you can develop empathy, the ability to see things from somebody else's perspective and, and um that, that requires asking questions to understand their perspective. And actually, my next book's on perception, and I have another assessment on perception that you and I will have to talk about down the road. But, you know, it's all tied in to this empathetic ability to, to see things from other angles, from unique ways. And if you're going to talk about critical thinking, you have to be able to analyze things and, and come up with decisions by not just you know, simplistic, oh, well, that sounds good. You have to go into depth, right? And you have to find out and explore. And all that comes out and comes down to being curious enough to realize that there might be a different answer, that your solution may not be the best solution. And what you, a lot of us don't know what we don't know. 
until we start exploring, and that requires curiosity. You, you know, just I mean, I love talking to you. I mean, from the first time we we got <laughs> yeah, on, I think we, so we were like best, we were like best friends, like <laughs> from the from like from the first breath uh, into this. Uh, but yesterday, uh, and again, it, it was just uh, well, I, I think it's not even the emotional intelligence where the curiosity came in, but as you said, empathy. And you go, well, how would curiosity help? I mean, people are just you know care about other people, and I show that, and I'm a friendly person, and well, you you can't be empathetic, and you without wondering what the other person feels right you, you you can display you can be caring you can give somebody a hug you can be sympathetic but you can't be empathetic because the empathetic is that uh, I'm, I'm standing in their shoes i understand it mm -hmm. I, I feel like it is and which and and again you, you, I, I mentioned earlier about integrating all these things debbie Debbie Levitt, who I mentioned earlier, and she wrote this book, Delta CX, and it's about UX, the user experience. So, it, you know, there's, there's a technical component to it. But as we were talking the other day, she has a chapter in her book, this Delta CX, on empathy. Mm -hmm. And it's for technology. I mean, basically, it's about technology. And she says, you can't define a user experience or a candidate experience or a customer experience without standing in the shoes of someone else. And in order to do that, you have to be curious. Right. Just standing in their shoes doesn't do anything if you're still looking through your eyes. Right. So right. you know. Active so, perception. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what, I, it, yeah. It just crosses over into, as you said earlier, it, it's like it keeps coming up. It crosses over into everything we do. And, yes. and again, empathy, compassion, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, every job skill list I look at of what, what you need to be successful in the future includes that. And yet I've never seen until you and I talked like a focus on curiosity because without curiosity, none of those things will happen. You know, it, it it's so true. And it, it, it's, I'm one of those people who likes to read a lot of these books. And actually I just recently had Donald Hoffman on my, my show. I don't know if you've read his book, The Case Against Reality. And mm, that's- No, I haven't. I, yeah. you gotta, I, I, I got a stack of them here. He's the best. It was great. I mean, the book's great. I hope people read it. But it, it gets into my work with perception, but that's all the, the questioning of what we think we know and what our reality is and versus what somebody else's reality is. And I think it's really important to know all these things and uh, to have that curiosity to um, ask the questions, uh, to explore things and, and not be afraid to um, give up on you're holding on to this. It has to be this one way uh, because everybody's perception of reality is different. And if if you don't open yourself up to that, your curiosity, you're, you're not going to be asking enough questions, enough depth to your questions sometimes. You know what I mean? And I mm -hmm. think that that's what fascinates me. And I think that the reason that the Curiosity Code Index is so important and fate, as we were talking about, which is fear, assumptions, technology, and environment were the four factors of fate, of what to, or hold people back from being curious, is not is addressing each of those factors and opening up that dialogue so that we recognize our perception of our curiosity and what's impacted it. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. So let's talk a little bit more about fate. So, okay. Uh, so um, you, you mentioned the acronym, and you, you can state that again, and then talk about each of those a, a little bit of, of, and especially, uh, you know, before we get to the close of this, which is coming up too fast, um, what can people do? I mean, how, how can people, uh, as I said, if, if everyone has this innate, has a gene, uh, and has this innate ability to be curious, but we killed it, uh, you know, for for these four reasons. Um, how can we kind of un, undo all that, and how can we prevent doing it to our kids and, right. and young people? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot there. Uh, first of all, yep. fate again stands for fear, assumptions, which really is the voice in your head talking to you, uh, technology, and environment. And what I did was I researched thousands of people for years to determine just the right questions to, to come up with the factors that inhibit curiosity. And those were the four that I found. And this is really important because if you can recognize what's stopping you, 
then you can move forward. And a lot of people don't even realize, like I said, you don't know what you don't know. They don't realize how much fear is holding them back or uh, what each of these factors. So what I started out with when I started researching this is I just really went into LinkedIn and asked people what holds them back from curiosity and because I was interested to see what people would say. And initially, I, overwhelmingly, it came over as a lot of fear-based things. And as I started to study it, I knew fear would be a factor, no question. But what was interesting were the other factors. But fear incorporates things like, you know, I, I don't want to say something in a meeting. I'm going to look stupid. I'm going to look unprepared. We all have the guy next to us. We go, hey, Bob, why don't you ask the question? Well, you know, whatever it is we don't want to ask, let Bob look stupid better than us, right? So right. We yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. So. <laughs> right. And so it's everybody's thinking these same questions and everybody's afraid to ask them because you've probably had somebody in the past that, that made you feel stupid or you've seen somebody else kind of be, be made to be mocked or something has happened that has made you feel this way. I've had a leader who looked at me and I, when I asked a question, he said, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Okay, well, what does that do? That tells me I'm either an idiot or the guy who taught me was an idiot or, you know, whatever. And right. that's, that's saying, I don't want to even hear the truth from you. I want you to pretend you know things and that you don't know. And it's, these are happening. And this guy, in his defense, was not a bad guy. He was taught to, to lead that way by his leader. So inadvertently, we have leaders saying things like, don't come to me with problems unless you have solutions. But then that sounded good at the beginning. But actually, that's saying, don't come to me with problems because you might not even be capable of figuring out the solution. So I don't want to hear about problems. So there's things like that that we say and we don't even know the impact and the damage it does. So under each of these four factors of fear, for example, on the assessment, there's eight questions under fear. There's eight under each of the, you know, so there's, you know, all, I mean, I'm sorry, nine questions under each. So you got 36 questions for the, the total of what they ask uh, on this assessment. And it's like an emotional intelligence test or disc or something where it spits out a PDF report, 26 pages, and it gives you, you know, this is how I am in terms of fear of looking dumb, or this is how I am in fear of of, um, you know, looking unprepared or whatever it is you fear. And it gives you feedback, like this is the reason behind this. And this opens up this dialogue for when we go through training that you can talk about these things. And even though your results can be private for you and no one else to see, it helps you with the overall um, end uh, of creating goals and ways to overcome this. So as we go into the next factor, we have assumptions, which is that voice in our head. And we all have that voice. Um, I, when I get in front of a, a live audience, sometimes I'll hold up a glass of water and I'll, you know, say, how he how heavy is this? And to make my point about how our, uh, assumptions hold us back, and people yell out in the audience, you know, ten ounces, seven ounces, whatever they say it is, and I'll say, well, you know, it it doesn't matter. What matters is how long I hold it, and if I hold it for a few seconds, no big deal, right? Uh, as I hold it for an hour, my arm starts to get sore. And if I hold it long all day, uh, you know, I'm become paralyzed. Well, that's how the thoughts are in our head, right? A fleeting thought doesn't really hold you back. You know, you just go oh, goes and whatever. But if we start to, you know, dwell on these negative thoughts that hold us back, that they, they start to paralyze us. So, so we need to put the glass down, right? We need to, <laughs> we need to stop telling ourselves some of these negative things that we don't even know we're telling ourselves. And so that's where the assumptions come in, the things that we, oh, I, I'm not going to like that. That sounds boring. Or why would I ever want to do that? That'd be a lot of time. Or whatever it is we put into our minds uh, that talk us out of things, uh, we have to recognize. And then technology is, was an interesting one to me because um, technology can do things for us in too much. You know, we can over rely on it. We could ask our Echo to do every single thing and then not understand the basics behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like learning math without understanding the calculations behind math sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or we can under rely on it, some of what it could explore for us to create even better technology and innovation and ideas because we don't want to take the time that it, to learn it. We just learned the last system. Oh, do I really want to learn the next system? And, you know, there's all these other things that could tie into assumptions sometimes. So we have technology and then we have environment. 
And environment is really everybody you've ever met in your life, from your family to your friends to your teachers to your peers to, to your current boss, your past boss who told you to I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. So, you know, just every single thing that you've had in your life um, can impact you. I mean, when we get into school, we see that the five-year-olds had this great level, but you get into school and there's 30 kids in class and the teacher can't answer every single question. They have to teach to the test. They have all these other factors going on, right? So... It's really important to recognize, did teachers really answer my questions? Did I really like this when I was young? But when I asked about it, they said they don't have time. Or, you know, there's there's so much that can fall into environment. I mean, even in social media, think about if you post something and people don't like it. They don't, you don't get enough likes. Well, what do you do? Well, you might take it down, right? You look dumb. You put up this picture. No one liked it. I take it down. Whatever it is, we rely so much on everybody else's interpretation if it's okay or not okay. And with me, this was a bigger one. My family was super into sports and certain directions that I was not interested in at all. But my interest to them, business would be stupid to them. They would not like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so sure. you'd be berated if you liked something other than <laughs> what they liked. And we all have families that do that to some extent. They don't even intentionally do it. They just say, oh, well, this is what you should like. You should be a police officer. Or you should be a nurse or you should be this because this is what we've done in this family. You know, and some of that stuff will hold you back. And, and to recognize it is the hugest thing because you were talking about how to undo it. But how to undo it is to first see it. And then you, right. create <laughs> you need of, curiosity to undo it. You right? need it. Yeah, you need curiosity to, to overcome the fear. But you have fear. Of, you know, so it, it's it's kind of a puzzle. But I like puzzles, and the thing is, once you recognize it, if you take an assessment like the CCI, the Curiosity Code Index, it, it points out these things to you, and then you can create a kind of a personal SWOT analysis and action plan of how am I going to overcome this, what are my threats, who can help me, how am I going to get there, and fix it. Right. And you have uh, then there's worksheets that you've developed with that. And I'm sure there'll be more coming. I got a couple ideas. We, you, you and I need to chat offline yeah. after the show about it. Huh? Uh, so I got a couple great ideas there. And I know you do. You have a certification program. I've been certified. Um, and so yeah. you can do that. You can teach people in, inside companies how to do this. Um, and again, very, very simple, but it's highly relevant because although I love disc and I just did a, uh, you know, for my, for my buddy, uh, John Dame, uh, we work with the senior living organization yesterday and we work with their senior management and, you know, I, he called me in to, to kind of do a two hour session with disc. You know, I, I introduced the curiosity code in there because it's all part of that. It was part of that self-awareness. So there, there's just so much, uh, to yeah. be able to do it. And unfortunately, our curiosity has taken us almost to the end of the show, <laughs> so Aww. we're just we're barely scratching the surface here. Um, just for everybody, I mean, we we've, we've been talking with uh, Dr. Diane Hamilton about uh, about her new book, Cracking the Curiosity Code, which she certainly has done. Uh, we've been talking about decision, basically, just to give everybody a sense of where we were. Is curiosity, um, you know, impacts all the things we talk about: critical thinking skills, uh, 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 emotional intelligence empathy, compassion, but on, on there's, there's so much more in the book, so much more we could have talked about. It, it involves strategic thinking. How can, you, how can you plan for the future if you don't ask the right questions? Uh, strategic selling, employee engagement. If we're not asking the questions, what can we do? Uh, conflict resolution, if you're not stepping in the shoes of the other people. So is every single thing we do, curiosity is not just for those technical geniuses or the technology geniuses or the, fu the futurists. Um, it really affects all of us. So before we close, Diane, um, how can people kind of get a hold of you? And, uh, you know, what's the best way? Uh, I don't know. Well, you know, I have my personal site, which is drdianehamilton.com. You could also go to curiositycode.com. Uh, you can reach me on all the social media sites at Dr. Diane Hamilton. The doctor is not spelled out. It's just D-R. But uh, anybody can contact me and ask me any questions. I know uh, Ira is going to be able to answer a lot of these questions as well. So they can contact you for a lot of this as well. So, uh, you know, the great thing is, is that I've got a lot of people who are really interested in this. I'm talking to organizations all around the world. We're required reading at the Forbes School of Business and their HR program. And at UNSA, which is University of Zambia in Africa and their MBA wow. program. It's, 
going to be in an app that's based out of Reed Hoffman's work, uh, you know, and coming up next year. There's just so much that this is tied oh, into. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm just thrilled and excited to be part of it. And then uh, hopefully within uh, the next few days, uh, I will have it available on my site. Um, it will be actually at cci.successperformancesolutions.com. You'll be able to get it through the main site and uh, you'll be able to order the assessment online, uh, talk about how to get certified, and um, we'll just continue this conversation. We're, we're barely scratching the surface, which is appropriate for curiosity. So, yeah. Diane, thank you very, very much. Uh, this just went way too fast, um, you know, especially when you're, you're, you're talking about a great guest like you and, and a subject that we both love. So uh -huh. thanks very much and uh, wishing you a lot of luck on cracking the curiosity code and can't wait to hear about perception. Yeah, I, so. you have to be curious. <laughs> so thanks again, to everyone, who, for listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. We're always interested in hearing what's on your mind. Let us know how you're doing, how we're doing, and how you're doing. Uh, some challenges you have. Hopefully, uh, you'll all be a little bit more curious after today. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest or a sponsor, just sharing a few thoughts, call us, connect with us. Uh, you can go to geekskeezersgoogleization.com. Um, you can fill out a contact form. All our podcasts are up there. Uh, don't forget to join Googleization Nation. Uh, you can connect with me or Keith on LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, almost any other social media. Thanks again to Zor.ai and Success Performance Solutions for being our sponsors, for helping us being on the air. And don't forget to join us next Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, W4CY.com, or you can listen to any of, uh, any of our episodes on the podcast. Uh, from iHeart to uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, Amazon, you name it, we're there. Uh, until next week, this is Ivor Wolf. Don't let the shift hit your plans. <music>